Uh, hello, my name is Matthew. I'm from uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD for short, and today I'll be presenting Bracktooth, causing havoc on Bluetooth Link Manager via direct fuzzing. So to start, uh, what is the motivation of this project? So first, if you take a look on the st standard workflow of, of a fuzzing, uh, 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 fuzzing a program, you usually have the step of a generated input, then there is the input with, which is goes to the certain software, and then the software, uh, uh, the outputs, something, and then later it analyzes it, whether the program crashes or not. However, if we analyze this in a wireless context, there is some issues uh, when injecting a packet and also getting this output, uh, because may not be straight far to control this, this input. So if you look, one of the, the, one of, one of the main points uh, of uh, motivation is that uh, notably for wireless protocols, there is uh, a high complexity and, uh, with uh, responses between uh, target and the other devices that are communicating. There's a lot of states. So the, uh, the more complex the protocol is, certainly there is a lot of uh, uh, indications that uh, uh, we, can have, uh, we can find more bugs there. So the other uh, motivation is that because it's so difficult to sometimes control uh, the inputs that uh, are exchanged between two devices, uh, there's also uh, arises some questions, like if it's difficult to, to control uh, inputs, then may be difficult to test, and this may, may be able to, um, if implying a, a good solution or fuzzing, be able to find a lot of bugs. So one of the biggest is issues of that, why it's so difficult to control is because uh, uh, there's a lot of closed source implementation, particularly for Bluetooth Classic. And uh, the other uh, difficult thing uh, on wireless context for fuzzing is that uh, the wireless timing uh, is important there. So if the fuzzer is not uh, 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 fast enough, you may get issues when trying to communicate with devices uh, over the air, for example. So another, another issue that we, uh, at the time of writing, that we, we, we saw that uh, the current fuzzers for Bluetooth Classic uh, they're either gen generational, which they, they may uh, have a state machine implemented by hand, and this may be too complex because the protocol is always uh, being updated and it's difficult to keep, uh, keep track of all the possible uh, implementations uh, details. The other thing is that there's some other fuzzers, they just generate uh, uh, inputs randomly, which are mutation-based uh, mutation fuzzers, and a lot of inputs are discarded. So if we want to, uh, to now highlight uh, exactly what is our target during this fuzzing project and also where we locate on the, on the state of art, first we can take a look on the standard Bluetooth architecture. So if you, saw, uh, if you see the figure on top left corner, usually you usually have the main processor, which is your smartphone, then you have the external hardware, which is the Bluetooth uh, controller. And uh, notably, if you take a look on the, how the protocol stack is organized, you have a separation between the host layers, which resides on your smartphone, and then the controller, which is a separate closed source uh, controller. And this is our objective most in this work. So if you take a look uh, at the time of writing, the types of fuzzers that we, that we saw that are uh, trying to uh, fuzz uh, a range of protocols with Bluetooth Classic, usually have this uh, BT host fuzzing. Notably, this one is uh, easy to get started because it does not require special hardware. However, it only works for host uh, layers. The other one is uh, emulation, which is very fast and can reach all the layers. However, it requires a lot of knowledge about the architecture and this limits the device that we can test. Then it's our work, which is similar to the first one. However, uh, uh, in a, in a, it's similar to the first one. However, uh, the difference here uh, is that we uh, targeted the lower layers uh, by using external hardware here. And uh, of, there is the trade-off of that is that whenever we introduce over there uh, fuzzing approach, that, uh, the fuzzing process is a bit slower, but the advantage is that we can test a multitude of devices. So if you take a look on the overall architecture of the framework, we introduce in sort of a three steps to fuzz a, a Bluetooth classic device. And uh, the first, uh, we have a normal communication between the protocol stack and the target device. And the first stage is to uh, st uh, initiate the stating mapper. So with this, we introduce the, the framework uh, between the communication of the protocol stack and the target device. And with the, we try to reconstruct the stating machine. And with the information of the stating machine, uh, it feeds the mutation block. And it tries to, uh, in a way, to, to direct the device in situations which can cause crashes by mutating a valid packed from the, from the stack. And the last component is the duplication component, which the sole purpose of this component is to send packets out of order to also try to make the device behave in a different way and cause a crash. The last uh, important component is the monitor uh, component, which, because it's over the air, it needs some way to get feedback. 
And uh, one of the ways is to uh, hook up some connections between the fuzzer and the external device. However, I want to go uh, in detail on this presentation because of time, but you, can see, you are invited to see more details on the paper. Now, starting by the first component, the, the state mapper, uh, it requires us the first input, a, a reference capture provided by the user, and then second, a mapping rules file, which the user also uh, provides. And this uh, mapping rules is a file that is intended to describe how the state mapping uh, should be created uh, using the reference capture. So the output of the state mapper, we call this mapped states, and the object of this output is to do two things. The first is to inform the, the, the fuzzer what's the state of during the communication. The second is to detect unexpected responses in a way, for example, as a non-compliant responses that deviate from the standard in a way that uh, is not on the, this uh, reference uh, module. So uh, for example, here, uh, we have uh, mapping rules uh, in, in JSON format. And uh, there's two fields here that are particularly important, which we call the filter and the state name field. Filter is to filter certain packets. For example, here we have two packets, P1, P2. One uh, packet is a LMP packet. The second one is another protocol, uh, L2K packet. Filter, uh, it's meant to filter out either one uh, protocol or another. But the state name field here is the one that is going to tell the state mapper how to classify the state of this packet. So depending on, the, on what the user inputs on the state name field and indicates the name of this, uh, this, this, this type field, the, these packets go to the packet decode phase. The packet decode will analyze this type field. It will generate some information, uh, which we call this decoding tree. Then it goes to the state mapper. After that, the state mapper uh, gets this decoding tree information with also the mapping rules from the user. And then it creates, uh, it labs this packet and uh, it connects to the, to the previous, uh, previous packets, so the state machine starts to, to get connected. So for each packet, there is associated label, and uh, this process uh, continues uh, for each uh, packet that is on the reference uh, provided by the user. So for the second uh, part, um, the second stage of the workflow now is really the, the fuzzing part. So now what we have is the whenever we receive a packet from the the target device that we intend to first, for example, a smartphone or an audio device. Uh, it goes to the state machine, uh, which uh, it was created uh, by the mapped states. And then the framework outputs this uh, mutation probabilities array. This array uh, is important here because it, it tells what's the chance of, of a particular packet for that state to be fuzzed. So for example, uh, during the communication process, uh, uh, because the framework does not generate the packets, but rather intercept them, we wait for a, a transmission packet to arrive, and then the framework uh, will analyze this packet. So for example, here we have a L2K packet for, uh, used in Bluetooth Classic, and then it goes to the decoding tree uh, to analyze what type of packet it is. It goes to the state mapping. The state mapping will tell the fuzzer what is the, the probabilities for that particular packet. And then uh, there is a chance, depending on the layers of that particular packet, to be mutated. So for example, in this particular packet, we have uh, layers such as baseband, ACL, and L2CAP. So for each one of these layers, there is associated chance on this array to be mutated. For the, the second packet, for a different protocol, uh, which, we, which is a LMP at the end, then there is a different position for that particular packet in this array. So, until now, I, I only talked about how it's first, but uh, the optimization happens then on this array. So the algorithm that we use to optimize this array is PSO, and the cost function that we, we use is actually the number of transitions uh, that the device performed on the state machine. And the intuition of that is to try to direct the fuzzing process uh, in a way so that particular layers of a, of a packet can trigger the device to, to explore more uh, the communication and eventually can trigger a crash. So that's the intuition uh, behind choosing, uh, organizing the, the mutation probabilities in such a way that the layers are, are uh, kind of directing the process of fuzzing. So the final stage is uh, also very critical for this uh, particular project on BT Classic is that because it's closed source, there is no easy way to just create your own uh, interface or your own software to send packets over the air. So what we did is we selected a controller, uh, a chip controller that we, which supports Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and BLE, and we modified its firmware and reverse engineered some parts of the firmware so we could take control over the input, 
recording from the, from the second slide, this input is uh, extremely important and control over it is crucial for a proper uh, fuzzing uh, program. So here it shows, for example, the, uh, the two chain process of Asper2 uh, SDK. So we have the user code there for the fuzz interface, which compiles to a film.elf. Until now, it's pretty standard. So now we need to do the reverse engineer part and perform some patching. So one of the things that we do is first to patch the final binary, this firma.elf. And the idea here is that we introduce on the compilation process an API that you can redirect certain functions of the SDK, which is closed source, to the user code. So we can, by reverse engineering, changing some packets, some fields before it returns to the stack. The second part is uh, patching from inside what we call, because some parts of the Bluetooth uh, classical library for this device is actually on the read-only memory. And this we cannot modify uh, by changing the, the compiled uh, binary. So therefore, we introduce uh, an API so that the user can call on the firmware side and it can read directly the, the read-only memory, any region of the memory that, that includes code that is on the read-only memory. So it can redirect also to some code that the user did to, to take control over the, uh, the LMP packets. So Another thing that uh, after this uh, patching process, another thing that is extremely important uh, is the real-time requirements. So particular for Bluetooth Classic, uh, every 600 to 5 microseconds, there is a packet being transmitted. So we also need to make sure to intercept packets during the fuzzing process or handle them in uh, less than uh, this time. So we can solve this issue by using, for example, a high-speed USB which gladly comes with these uh, S32 boards. Uh, you can buy this uh, controller separately, but you can also buy a development board which has this uh, USB high speed. And this uh, solved a lot of issues. We were able to get an average of around 200 microseconds of round trip time between the S32 and the computer. So latency was not an issue anymore. And uh, we also created a dissection hooks framework so users can create an exploit. But uh, we don't detail uh, here uh, because of time, but uh, we showed an example on the paper if you're interested. So going to evaluation, then we reached to, uh, we also evaluated the, the impact that some of the components uh, do, does on the overall fuzzing process. And uh, on this figure here, it shows, uh, it shows on the vertical axis the number of crashes and uh, deadlocks, and also uh, in respect to iterations. So each line is a, is a, is a variant, and uh, it indicates that uh, the, the, with all components enabled, uh, we get the most crashes. However, the main takeaway is that Duplication and mutation alone cannot find all the crashes because some crashes are very specific to the either mutation or receiving packets out of order. The other thing is, even though all got a lot of crashes, the duplication plus mutation, because they compete with each other, delays a bit uh, the process. So the early iterations may not find crashes with, all, with the all variant. So just the summary uh, of our work, we evaluated in total 13 devices from 11 vendors. We discovered 18 unknown implementation flaws, so a total of uh, 24 CVs. Uh, we classified them as either crashes or deadlocks, but we got one remote code execution for the S32, which is, happens to be the same device that we used to do the fuzz interface. We also got uh, six bug bond award, uh, awards uh, with uh, dis discoveries. And uh, to show that our framework is extensible, we also created a variance for Wi-Fi and BLE. Uh, so we just need to change the protocol stack, fuzz interface, and map rules, although for a fuzz interface, this time we don't need the reverse engineering because for Wi-Fi and the BLE, things are a bit uh, easier, uh, more open source in this, in this sense. So we also got some results. Uh, even, we even found uh, 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 a deadlock for Raspberry Pi 3, and this one is particularly interesting because the Raspberry Pi 3 Wi-Fi stops working and using it to do a power cycle. So six unknown bugs for the extensions. So in conclusion, the, the impact, I'd say, was, uh, is, was, uh, is, is huge in the overall industry uh, because we exposed a lot of firmware bugs and also non-compliances in hundreds of uh, Bluetooth chipsets. So in the paper, we only test with 13, uh, but uh, the overall impact is more chipsets because a lot of devices, they use a family of different models. So if one code base is affected, another uh, hundreds of code bases from different chipsets are also affected. So after the disclosure period, which was uh, 31st August last year, I, uh, another researcher performed independent testing and they found other vendors uh, to be affected, like MediaTek, Samsung, Aroha, and Apple. So this work also highlighted the need for a better security-oriented tools for overall testing. 
So this work focuses on fuzzing, but it could be other different tools. Overall, the field itself needed better tools to test the implementation of uh, wireless devices. We also, uh, with this work, I also enabled lower, uh, a more lower cost device for Bluetooth classic experimentation because S32 is a cheap device, so with $5, you can get this to, to work. Uh, we also shown that the fuzzer can be generalizable with introducing Wi-Fi and BLE there. And uh, one of the disadvantages is that, uh, of course, because it's an over-the-air device, uh, the monitoring option matters. So if there's no monitoring, then the fuzzer may miss crashes. So uh, here, just show the, that the code is, is available. We can get the, the GitHub for the patching framework, which has the, fear, the first interface. And then we have the source code you can request uh, by using the links. Uh, we also get, uh, placed there the link for the disclosure if you want to take, uh, take a look on more details on the, each one of the vulnerabilities. With that, end my uh, presentation, and thank, thank you all.